here. Welcome to the MuseScore Cafe. So today I uh, said I want to talk about the real book, which is a fake book that is used by jazz musicians all over the world and really has an interesting story behind it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of the backstory and about my involvement in it and uh, some of the lessons that I've learned, the things that I like about what we did, the things that maybe could have been done differently, and how to do some of the stuff in MuseScore that you might want to do. So let's, uh, let's talk about the real book. So first of all, I should also say a cu couple things. One is um, it was pointed out to me that when I'm talking during the theme music, uh, audio was not very good, and I think it's because my speaker was on. So I'm, that's part of why I have headphones on now, and hopefully that worked better. And if not, then uh, I will work something else out. Uh, but uh, feel free to let me know how how my uh, my talking worked over the music. Um, and then the other thing is, okay, so the real book is obviously a jazz thing, but a lot of what I want to talk about as far as how things relate to MuseScore won't be specific to jazz, so don't feel like if you're not a jazz person, this isn't for you. Um, you know, there's things about it that'll be primarily of interest to uh, jazz musicians. So um, let me just take a quick uh, gander at uh, the chat, and uh, I love to see people checking in from all sorts of places. I see Canada. Uh, Quebec is actually where uh, my mother's family is from, um, or yeah, somewhere in Quebec anyhow. I'm not sure where, to be honest. Um, so uh, I want to show you the real book. So this is what the thing looks like, um, if you've never seen it. Uh, <laughs> it's a book that has songs written in a uh, lead sheet format. These are jazz, either compositions by jazz musicians or um, songs commonly played by jazz musicians, which often means things like uh, show tunes from the 40s, movie themes, popular music of the 30s, 40s, 50s that jazz musicians like to cover. And um, so what, you know, they're written in this lead sheet format with just a melody and chord symbols. And there's a million fake books out there. The real book is just one particular fake book, but it's the one that sort of became, I don't know, the standard. It's what, um, I don't know, many, many people uh, started using when it came out because they got a lot of things... A lot of things right, I guess, when it came out. A lot of things maybe not so right, but compared to the other fake books that existed, it had a lot going for it um, when it first came out. And um, so uh, the um, the original real book, so the Romper Room, I'm not sure what that's about, but uh, feel free to let me know. Uh, uh, so uh, when the real book first came Came out was like late seventies, early eighties, I want to say, and it was it was originally produced by some uh, uh, college students in Berkeley, uh, the Berkeley School of Music in Massachusetts, and um, they they did their best to transcribe songs from recordings and make uh, reasonable versions of things. So why it's a fake book is if you think about like what traditional notated music looks like. If you want to play a song, you expect to have every note notated for you. But that's not the case here. This is like, let me, I should have one of my own uh, lead sheets. Um, uh, loaded up here. That would have been smart to have already had that done, right? So if you look at a song of mine like Reunion, which, you know, I use as a demonstration all the time, Right, it's all fully notated, but I also have a lead sheet version of that, and apparently not in this folder. I don't, but somewhere I do. Um, if I come here, oh well, I'll just open another one. Uh, this is a lead sheet here. It's it's not fully notated. It's just got the melody and chords. The idea was, and this was sort of. Um, 
uh, slaying and maybe disparaging at that to say, well, I can't really read music, but I can fake it if you give me a lead sheet and chord symbols. And then I'm not reading all the notes, but I'm producing something myself. In, in reality, there's nothing fake about it. it right? It's just a different way of conveying musical intent that allows the performer to choose their own chord voicings, how they're going to play that E flat seven chord, not being, uh, you know, locked into how uh, this person, me, wrote this music out note for note. And so the the term was really derogatory. Really, it, it's a and if you think about it as applies to classical music, yeah, if you wanted to produce. Um, a, a Beethoven sonata and reduce it down to just a melody and chord symbols, which I have done. Um, in some sense, that is faking it because the real sonata has all this detail to it that's not you're not going to reproduce just by uh, a melody and chord symbols. On the other hand, you might fill in other more interesting details. And so again, it's not there's nothing inherently worse about it as a technique, but it's uh, it's um, just different than what people were used to. So. <clears throat> Um, yeah, Steve Swallow and Mick Goodrick, they were, uh, instructors at, uh, Berkeley as, uh, and Pat Metheny had either, was either currently instructing there or had just come through there. There were a number of people who were involved with the production of it. Um, and maybe some of the transcriptions were Steve's. A lot of the story is a little, you know, it's hush hush because it was illegal. They, they, they just made these transcriptions and started selling the book without paying the, the composers any royalties because they didn't know how to do that. Not that they were unwilling to, but the mechanisms didn't exist for this. And so um, there are people, if you, if you search around online, you can find, you can piece together a little more of the story. But um, yeah, I definitely bought, exactly. I bought, uh, I bought my real book, uh, from the back of some guy's station wagon uh, at the parking lot of the steak and egg kitchen in Tallahassee, Florida at 6 a.m. under, you know, we met at a, underneath a street lamp. I mean, it was, it was basically a drug deal. <clears throat> so um, the, uh, yeah. And the reason why, why there's so many Steve Swallow songs and other um, songs of Berkeley faculty is because they were involved in the production of it, even if perhaps their students were doing more of the actual work. So um, basically this became a standard, even though maybe there are some errors and it wasn't paying uh, copyrights and some questionable choices on a number of matters, but it kind of became the standard. Um, so uh, I'm going to type something in here. So Berkeley, Berkeley School of music is where they were students. Berkeley, which is what uh, um, Berkeley is a city and school in California, where I actually got my master's, <laughs> uh, but totally unrelated, totally unrelated. So definitely uh, one of those situations where um, uh, spelling counts. But yeah, Berkeley School of Music, I've never even been to. So um, for a long time, throughout the 80s and 90s, that's just the way it was. For like 20 years, this fake book was like being used by musicians and for better or for worse, and I'll talk about some of the issues there. But then in the early 2000s, the publishing company, Hal Leonard, got it in their head that, okay, we've been letting people sell these illegal books with no royalties being paid for too long. We own the copyrights to a lot of these songs. We, there's no way we could go around suing the, the, these uh, people selling uh, fake books out of the back of their station wagons because we can't find them all and it's just way too much work and and would just give us a bad name. So they decided, well, uh, let's just do it ourselves. They just produced their own legal version of the, the real book. And I don't have a copy of the old illegal one with me, um, but this cover, <laughs> they literally photocopied. They took a, a photo, a picture of the original cover and just stole it. And they stole the tape. I mean, they, they, they <laughs> it's really pretty brilliant. They just literally copied everything about the original real book that they could get away with copying from a technical perspective. And um, uh, they, uh, they copied as many of the lists of songs. There were a few songs they couldn't get the rights to for various reasons. Um, they added some songs also, but they wanted to basically reproduce the original real book, but make it legal, pay the royalties. And since they owned the royalties for some of them, it, you know, it, they basically 
get paid themselves also, but they paid all the royalties to the other companies. However, in the very first printing of it, they made a point not to include any songs that their big rival, uh, Warner Brothers, owned the copyrights to, which was a silly decision that they've now gone back on and they've got those tunes. But at the time, they were like, they didn't even want Warner Brothers to know they were working on it. This was like Coke and Pepsi or Google and Apple. I mean, this was like a rivalry. And uh, so um, the uh, um, the the original printing of the real book did not have a number of songs that they either couldn't get the rights to or chose not to try to get to the rights to because they didn't want to um, show their hand. Now, I knew someone who was working in a music store and he had told me, you know, uh, like a month ahead of time, he had gotten some pre, pre uh, they had gotten some press releases or whatever that they weren't supposed to put out until the book came out. But he gave me a heads up. Hey, look, Hal Leonard's putting out a version of the real book. I think you'll be interested in. And so the day the book actually showed up there, he called me up that morning and said, oh, the book showed up. And I went over there to the store, bought the very first copy like an hour after they arrived, spent the whole day going through it. And that night I posted a review of it online 2004 yeah i don't remember where i posted it i think it was a news group uh rec.music.blue note probably and it was a very detailed review of it um where you know i didn't have any special insight i didn't know what they were trying to do but i deduced a lot i was able to tell oh wow look at that they took the cover they took these court they took these songs these were some songs they didn't include i wonder why here's some speculation here's some of the musical choices they made some of the editing choices they made here's why i think those were good choices here's ones maybe i disagree with but on the whole it's a really good thing that this book exists that was the bottom line <clears throat> and it was a really detailed a review because I thought, you know, this is an important moment in history. We're, we're po potentially going to be replacing this illegal fake book with a, a legal version that also hopefully corrects some errors. And uh, the because I posted it that same day, um, because I posted it that same day, they were busy like Googling themselves to see who's who's talking about our new real book. And they saw my review. And the next day, the vice president of the company, who was actually someone who helped uh, push for this project, called me up on the phone and said, wow, we, um, we really like what you've uh, done here. And uh, we think that you really seem to understand this project. And from what we can see of uh, your website or whatever, it looks like you know a thing or two about music. Um, you know, we're working on volume two, three, and four. Would you like to help? And so I basically got hired by Hal Leonard to work on volumes two, three, and four of the real book. And in the process is where I said I learned a lot about the process of putting together lead sheets. I mean, I'd been making lead sheets for a long time doing things my own way. And the real book had its own way of doing things. And what was interesting is it was not Hal Leonard's way at all. Hal Leonard had their own standard for how they did fake books. But when they did the real book, they chose to copy some of the decisions made in the original real book. And they chose to copy some of them because they wanted it to seem as much as possible like the original other than fixing errors. And, uh, but eventually they kind of changed their mind about some of those too and said, you know what, some of those original decisions just were not good decisions. And in later editions, uh, or I should say later volumes, volume two, volume three, volume four. And then there was like a rock reel book and a blues reel book. In some of these other ones, they actually change some of those decisions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about what some of these things are. So the piece that they actually asked me to do as kind of an audition was this one here, Vince Guaraldi's Cast Your Fate to the Wind. This, you may recognize, is not MuseScore. 2004 MuseScore was not a thing. I mean, it was like a research a research project. It was not, it was not nowhere near. It was still six years away from version one. I had never heard of it. Sorry, need some carbs. Um, so this was in finale and that's what I was using. They were actually using their own software. I think they were probably using score. They didn't ever say what it was. They said they had their own special in-house software. I now know that Score is a program that most major publishers were using, and this is what MuseScore's new default font, uh, Leland, is based on the font in Score. But in any case, they had a really interesting process where 
I would send them basically a PDF file that I produced in Finale. They would enter the notation into their own program, which again, I think was SCORE, and they had a, a font for the notes that looked a little bit handwritten. And I think the clefs and yeah, the uh, clefs and accidentals and notes and things were handwritten, but they didn't enter the text, including chord symbols. They actually hand wrote in the text and chord symbols because they didn't have a font that did for them what they wanted. So they actually had someone hand write in the chord symbols in the first few editions. Anyhow, they picked this song for me as kind of an audition because uh, it's, it's, well, I don't know why they chose it. I just know they, um, uh, they did. And it, it was really an interesting choice because it, it's really a challenging piece in a lot of ways to figure out how to do a lead sheet for. And unfortunately, this lead sheet was exported by Finale and something went wrong at the end here. Um, so Finale did something bad here when it exported the PDF. Um, but this is essentially what it looked like. And so one of the very first decisions you make in producing a lead sheet is, I mean, if it's a short tune and it's just going to fit on a page, great. But if there's anything complicated about it, you have to think, am I going to try to make this all fit on one page or is it worth doing two pages for? And we kind of decided this song we're going to make fit on one page, um, even though there was a, a little bit tricky about doing it. So that's one reason why we're doing things like, like using... Um, uh, well, actually, this piece didn't have as much going on as that. But often, I don't like writing out a like if a song is a a b a. I don't like writing the two a sections with a repeat and then uh, uh, um, uh, uh, d s for the last a section with a coda for the final a section because that's too much scanning around like this, and you have to do that every single chorus, right? As you're playing the tune you play that tune down then you play that tune down again while you're improvising and again and again it's it's distracting to have to jump around too much and so you, one of the things you need to do is balance how much you're willing to make people jump around on the page versus how much space you want to save and so there's some there's some really tricky decisions there and but on conversely there's another decision to make if you've got two A sections that are exactly the same, the advantage of putting repeat signs around them is now you know they're exactly the same. When you're reading the second A section, you you don't have to think as hard. You just read it and you know, oh, just do the same thing again. You don't have to read through carefully to see if there's some subtle little change. And a lot of these songs have that, right? Especially like Cole Porter songs. Cole Porter songs are sort of famous, notorious, infamous, whatever, uh, uh, beloved to me, um, because they typically include really interesting variations from one A section to the next. Um, I got to come back to uh, the chat, make sure I'm not missing anything in particular, but there you go. So um, yeah, you want there to be this balance. Like if it's an A, A, B, A form, I don't mind seeing that A section with a repeat sign around it, but I don't want to see that final A section have to be a D, S on it. I'd rather see it written out the third time because that's a little too much jumping around given that there's going to be more to come. So this piece had, um, it, you know, had to make that decision about the repeat. Uh, the, the form actually is more like a, A, B, I guess. It's not, there's not even a final A on it really. And then the solo section is something different. It's just a series of four chords over and over again. It's a really, oh my God. I'm looking at this and thinking, did I get those chords wrong? But no, these are right. And this, there's also on the recording, you know, as I'm transcribing this, you're having to make decisions like, you know, that that chord, that A flat chord. Is it really an A flat seven? Because mostly he's not playing sevens. He's playing A flat triads with some six. And I could have called it A flat six. But then again, there's some considerations about when you call something a sixth chord versus when you call it a major seventh versus when you call it a seventh. And it's in situations where there's any ambiguity about it. And it turns out there's a lot of them. And so one of the things you do is you you listen really carefully to every time through that solo and you listen to how he's phrasing his melodies, how he's voicing his chords to decide whether that's an A flat seven or whether you just want to call it A flat 
triad or A flat six. And I remember agonizing over that decision. But there's a number of other things that made this tune especially interesting and challenging. One was these quarter note triplets that start on beat two and straddle a bar line. So that's just a tricky thing to decide how you want to do. But uh, then actually doing it even in finale was kind of a pain in the butt. And I'll, I'll try to do this in music score because it's a pain in the butt in music score also. This, uh, when I did this, I chose to notate this as uh, that, that second triplet there tied across the bar line to make it maybe as opposed to notating this as a quarter note kind of straddling the bar line. Either way, it's, it's, it requires fakery. Um, but let me try to just do that because why not? Um, uh, so this is like one of the things that you might want to know how to do, right? So it was a quarter rest. Oh, and there was a key signature of, of four flats. So let me get that going here. And I'm going to come back to the key signature because that was its own little issue. Um, so it's it's a quarter note triplet. So total duration. Ooh, let me go to my um, demo mode here. So you can see what I'm typing. So uh, I type six for half note, control three, and uh, what did I do? Um, five. And then what? I already forgot what I'm doing. And then B flat F. So now what I really want is a quarter note triplet across that bar line. But of course, MuseScore doesn't support it. So what, there's a number of ways I could possibly get around that. One, if I really wanted the quarter note triplet, is I could select these two measures and join them together. Join selected measures. And now I can make this be a, uh, um, a quarter note triplet. Um, And then, so now it's one big joined measure. And now I can add like a little fake bar line. And I have to decide, because it really happens in the middle of that F. I have to decide where to put that bar line, but I think I'm going to put it here. So I'll go to the bar lines palette and add myself a little fake bar line. So that's a way. Um, if you, yeah, let me just add some A flat quarter notes so you can get a sense of the tempo. Right, that's that's how that piece goes. And it took me a long time to sort out that that's what that was. Quarter note triplets across the bar line. I'm really I'm really convinced they picked this piece because they knew it was going to be tricky in, in that way. Um, but so this is one way of achieving that uh, triplet across the bar line uh, kind of notation. However, if I really wanted to do what they had, and then of course I could write that as two tied Fs also. And so in fact, if I did that, And then tied them, and then came over to the bar line. I mean the uh, uh, beam properties palette, and broke that beam, and then got rid of this bar line, but added a new fake bar line right here. I would have exactly what I did in finale with about the same amount of uh, fiddling. To be honest, I'm not sure that I would do that though. Uh, this is really now one big measure. Um, it just looks like two measures. I would have to like reset the measure numbering um, to do this. Like this really should count as two measures. That's measure one, two, three, four. This guy should be measure five, but you see it says four there. Um, so I would have to uh, like tell this measure here, I'd have to go to measure properties and then tell it to add one to the measure number if I wanted the measure numbering to come out. Now, as you'll notice, uh, measure numbers are not used in most lead sheets. So I'll show you how to turn those off. Well, I'll show you how to turn them off and then I'll tell you what you really wanna do. What you really wanna use is a template that has all this stuff set up for you. But if I go to format, style, measure numbers, I can just turn them off. And then I don't have to worry about things like adjusting those measure numbers. But as I said, I probably wouldn't have done it that way. I might have done it this way in MuseScore. I might have created my first triplet. Let's get those all up an octave. And then I might have made this just be an ordinary um, 
uh, what was it? Oh, sorry, that's a quarter note, B flat, and then F, and then tied it over to another F, another triplet. So I'll enter that, that triplet. You have to, if you want to tie into a triplet, you actually have to enter the triplet, then go back and enter the tie. There's no way to do that in one step to tie into a triplet. Um, if that made sense. And then I can go and tie this. So I might have chosen to notate it this way. It's the same exact thing. It's just showing it as two separate eighth note triplets. But I probably thought about doing that and then decided, you know what, that's a little confusing because it makes it look a little more complicated than it really is. It's nice to see that the that this boo ba um is the same rhythm as ba uh, um. It's the same rhythm, so you want it to kind of look the same. So I think I would have made this uh, bracket invisible and then taken this one and then just sort of uh, manually uh, kind of adjusted it. So that's probably how I would have done the job personally. Uh, but in any case, all of these methods work. I've showed you like three different methods that all kind of work for creating this notation. And I remember in Finale having to do similar fiddling to get it to work. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, every program is going to have its own little ways of, of working these things out. So Already, as I'm looking at this, I've showed you about like deleting those measure numbers. There's a few other things, right? Like the 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 default in MuseScore 3.6 is using kind of the 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 more classical standard. Well, it's not just a classical standard. It also applies to jazz if we're talking about parts in a in a score. Like if you have if you have like the MuseScore Cafe here, the main score here, but at the individual, each part has the first. Uh, like the trumpet part has the first system indented. That's pretty common. Even, so even in jazz, indenting the first system is common. It's just not common for lead sheets. Um, so if you're trying to make a lead sheet, what I would do is I would go to format, style, and uh, where am I? Score. Disable the indentation on the first system. But then there's a number of other things like, oh, gee, look, the font. It's it's just that default Leland font. It's not the cool jazz font. Uh, so you could go to format style and change to one of the two, two jazz fonts. And there's Petaluma. Um, so I've been using Muse Jazz because it's the older font, and that's what I'm used to. So that's what I'm going to use. But that's a lot. And then the text still isn't there. You have to set up all the text stuff. So that's kind of a pain in the butt, right? What you really want to do is instead of just starting with that default score, you want to go and use one of the actual templates. So what did I do? I went to File New or Control N, and then uh, yeah, cast your fate to, I'm not going to enter the whole song, um, cast your fate to the wind, and then jazz lead sheet template. And I'll just finish there. Um, so now a lot of that stuff is set up for me. It's gotten rid of the indent. It's set up the tech. It's set up the text fonts and the, the music font. It's gotten rid of the measure numbers. It's done a lot of the stuff you want it to have. And now I can copy over, uh, I think I'll use this version because that should have been starting in measure th three or so. Well, three plus the intro. Um, so if I come over here to measure three, well, there's there's my intro four bars, then one, two, three. Right here is where I'm going to paste it. And apparently I didn't successfully actually do the copy, which I've noticed sometimes happens where I think I've copied and yet I go to paste and nothing happens. And I, I wonder if there's not some sort of bug where somehow that gets lost, sometimes changing scores. But um, so, yeah, you can see that that all worked pretty well. One of the reasons I don't I'm not usually a fan of doing manual adjustments like I did there is I'm afraid that that adjustment is maybe not going to work well. Like right now, you can see that these notes are squished together closer than they were originally. So when I did it originally, this bracket exactly, well, maybe not exactly, but pretty close to exactly lined up with that stem in the copy. It 
overshoots the stem because the notes are a little more compressed. Is that a huge problem? No, but it's a reason why manual adjustments are not usually my favorite way of doing things. It's a reason why maybe I would have been better off with the other approach I showed of joining the measures because um, then I don't have to do these manual adjustments, but eh, either, either works. Okay. So, um, Measure three has more than four. So yeah, but the thing is measure this measure, if this is the measure you mean, it, it does only, it doesn't, if you look at, it only has part of that quarter note. It only has part of this triplet. It, so it's, it's actually technically right. If you actually look at this as, you know, these three add up to two beats and then these two add up to one beat. So one beat rest, two beats for that triplet one beat for that one. But it's it's definitely a little hard to wrap the brain around. Um, so one of the things that's a little different about how the real book does things, and this is one of the things that I said, they made the conscious choice to copy from the original real book, but later realized it really wasn't a great decision, is this idea that the clef and the key signature shouldn't be repeated on every system. Notice that the, usually in music, we repeat the clef and key signature on every system. They haven't done that. They've they've chosen not to repeat the key signature. And when I say they, I mean, this is obviously my chart, but it was my chart that I put together to try to adhere to what I saw their standards being, which were, again, copied from the original illegal real book. I'll talk about why I think that happened. In fact, I'm pretty sure. But so they d chose to say, you know what? We're not going to uh, repeat clefs. We're not going to repeat key signatures. They do repeat the clef on the first line here, but that's because otherwise you wouldn't know which clef it is. You wouldn't, when it goes down from two staves to only one staff, you wouldn't know which staff basically disappeared. So by the way, to do that, if I want a second staff, let me uh, select this first staff, say add staff. And now I have, two staves. And uh, let me add some breaks here. Oh, uh, format, add, remove system breaks every four bars. And oh, I need to select the whole score to do that with. It, it's probably not going to actually, actually, well, let me look at this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yeah, actually, we got lucky on this one. Sometimes first and second endings make it such that it's not literally every four bars, but this one has sort of an unusual phrase length. So now I've got page breaks every four bars. And now what I can do is go to format style and turn on hide empty staves. And it's hidden that base clef other than on the first system, because it assumes by default that I want it there. If I don't want it even on the first system and I only want actually has notes, I go back to that same dialogue and uncheck this option that says don't hide empty saves in the first system. But I do want it in the first system because that's where this ding, 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 ding is, right? This is, um, mm, oops, I need a, an A-flat key signature. Ding, Now notice, whoops, notice I'm tying this E flat across the bar line, right? I'm not across the bar line, across the middle of the measure. This is a standard thing to do. We want to pretend there's a little imaginary bar, uh, imaginary bar line dividing the measure in half. Anytime you have any sort of complicated rhythms, basically anything with eighth notes, uh, you you want to not beam eighth notes across there, not even have a note that start. You don't want to have a quarter note straddle that. Now, there are situations where if the whole piece is this rhythm, bing, ging, 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 and it's that same, these are all offbeat quarter notes, right? This is and of one quarter note, and of two quarter note, and of three quarter note. Had this been an and of four quarter note and tied across the bar line, and so it was boom, ging, 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 and it was just all these offbeat quarter notes, I might have elected to just say, you know what, I'm going to notate this as a quarter note. But here's a case where it's not about what I might want to do. It's about what are the standards that are actually 
being used by the publisher that I'm working for. So what I did was looked at the first volume and tried to find examples of that kind of rhythm, which are all over Brazilian music. So really all I had to do was look at, a, um, in fact, if I look at just a, if I look at Corcovado, I think I'll probably see um, the same exact rhythm. And uh, I would look at how they did uh, it's not under Corcovado, it's under Quiet Nights, I think, um, because they had they had a list of the tunes under the uh, under the titles that the uh, copyright is under for copyright reasons. So uh, I see them uh, using the same technique uh, here. It's exact. I, I picked that tune because it's got the same thing, and I don't know if you can really see that, but it's basically the same rhythm of um, bomb. Um, well. Bum, boo, da, dun, 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 dun. Right, it's got a, a whole series of bum, boo, da, dun, 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 dun. And so it's got all these offbeat quarter notes. And when they appear across the bar line, they chose to um, split it up. So I did too. And I think it's generally good practice. I, I don't like to break that rule unless it's really super consistent throughout the chart that that rhythm happens over and over again. Um, I don't like to do it because here it's only going to be for those four bars. We never see that rhythm again. So that's uh, my own personal choice also. So um, uh, doesn't the great sign is, yeah, so this, uh, yeah, so that um, I see questions about the, uh, yeah, that plus sign is telling me um, if, back to this, so uh, that this is really one big measure. Just happens to have a bar line in the middle of it, but that's not really two separate measures. This is one eight beat measure. If I right click it and go to measure properties, you'll see eight beats is how many beats are in it. Um, but the bar line kind of divides it visually into two sections. I'd, I could have used measure properties to tell it I wanted an eight four measure, but instead I used the join command to do that. So um, in any case, they, uh, in doing the original real book, they had decided they didn't. So I, I, I just did that hiding of the empty staves. I wanted to show you that. Um, but if I don't, if I don't show the clef, at least on the next staff, you wouldn't know, is this single staff here treble or bass clef, right? So showing the treble clef, at least on this staff is pretty important. It's maybe not so important to keep seeing it reproduced everywhere else. I say it's not important, and yet music throughout history has done that, right? I mean, if I look at the Musecore Cafe and look at my trumpet part here, all these things, I mean, every piece of sheet music you've ever looked at prior to 1970 or whenever fake books really started to, to become more prevalent, um, had clefts at the beginning of every system. And if there was a key signature, the key signature was repeated on every system. Sharp, one sharp, one sharp, one sharp, right? That's the norm. Um, and fake book writers have chosen, in some cases, to deviate from that norm. And they do it, I think, for one reason. It is because, um, let me delete these notes now because I don't really need them. What they really want to be able to do, uh, I'm going to delete this. Well, I'll, I'll copy and paste it down because who knows if I uh, might want it later. They wanted the bar lines to line up. They wanted the measures to be the same width. And they didn't want the clef and the key signature and time signature to steal so much space from that first measure that it made the other measures narrow, you know, uh, wider in comparison. And yet they didn't want to have to make the first measure wider and then have the next system not line up. Now, why did they want that? I I'll tell you why. It's because they weren't using notation software. That's why. It's because they did this by hand. They wanted to just take a piece of paper and take a ruler and divide that staff into quarters and just draw bar line straight down the page, dividing it up into fourths because they couldn't be bothered to try to second guess exactly where to place these bar lines. That takes skill. It takes skill to figure out. Like if you look at this measure here, this line here, this measure is wider than the other measures and it's supposed to be wider. It's got more notes in it. It's supposed to be wider than an empty measure. If these had just been uh, whole notes, 
then this would be correct notation here. The measure with more notes in it needs to be wider. So um, they kind of, and that's a normal factor, a normal fact of music engraving that we expect the measures to be a different width. We don't want them to be the same width normally. It's part of how we read rhythms is by that spacing. However, they had to sacrifice that to get consistent measure widths to make it easier to just draw bar lines straight down the page. Now, I will also say, as an additional element, there is advantage to not having too much variation in me oh, by the way, another reason why it's good to have variation in measure widths is it's actually bad for the bar lines to completely line up. It's bad for readability because it makes it easier to get lost. If all the systems have the bar lines in the same place, then it's easier to sort of lose your tr lose place, lose track of where you are on the page. Um, it's a subtle thing. It's not like literally that's going to cause you to get lost, but a lot of the things we do are to avoid the subtle little things that might just slightly increase the chance of errors. And having two lines that look too close to identical makes it that much more likely that if you look away from the page for a second to look down at your hands or to, you know, look up at the bartender to say, hey, give me another, uh, uh, another uh, bourbon. Um, uh, if you look away from the page for a second and then look back down, the more two lines look alike, the harder it is to reestablish your context. And the same for when there's like a DS or a repeat. So some of the rules for music notation are based on things like that, trying to help you keep your place. And so aligning bar lines traditionally has been seen as a bad thing. However, if we made these measures super narrow, and I'm, I'm using, as you can see, shift bracket, right? It's the curly brace. If I make those really narrow and these wider, this would be bad for readability also. Let me wait till it clears. Um, in a jazz context, because, let me add some chord symbols to this now. If I add A flat, E flat, A flat, E, f e flat, A flat, E flat, a flat, E flat. All right, bass player, you tell me, what are you seeing here? You're seeing A flat, E flat, A flat, E flat, A flat, uh, E flat some longer time later, right? You're not reading that melody. If you're a bass player, you're just reading the chord symbols. I mean, you're looking at the melody, sure, but realistically, you're focusing on the chord symbol. And not just bass players, pianists too. Anyone who's providing accompaniment as opposed to reading the melody is primarily reading the chord symbols. And if there's too much variety in your measure widths, you end up in situations like this where the chord symbols that should have been very regularly spaced they should have been every two beats. They don't look regularly spaced anymore. And now it's actually uh, making it more complicated. So it is advantageous to keep some more consistency. So if I select all this and I come to format, uh, I, I want to remove those stretch adjustments that I did. The defaults, you can see, are already spaced somewhat better. But this measure is still a little wonky because... Uh, just because of what's in it. So yeah, you could try adjusting things here. Like, well, they're literally that's because that's not <laughs> that's that's this is such a weird measure and there's not a chord simple change in the middle of it. But if there were, I might fiddle with the spacing of that to try to make this look like it makes more sense. But you know, even if I expand these measures to try to get, you know, I'm I'm doing this kind of visually by eye to try to get these bar lines to line up, it's still going to be the case the chord symbols, just because of the content of the measures, are not totally equally spaced. So there's an art to that also of figuring out, I don't know, how much, how hard you want to try to line up your bar lines, how much fiddling with spacing you're willing to do to get the chord symbol spacing as, as regular as the rhythm that is actually being implied. So in the real book, the original real book, they skipped, they hid the clefs and the key signatures. So they went like into staff properties. Well, you know, they did it by hand. But if you go to staff properties, and um, give me a second here. Just want to make sure that I'm, I always have to make sure I'm not losing my, uh, losing my site here. I mean, losing my, um, my screen. Um, so uh, don't show clef. Oh, I, I want to show the clef. I just don't want to show. 
I got to think about this. Is that that's not the wrong place? That's to not show clefts at all. That's not what I want. I want format style, and then uh, under the page here, I want to not create clefts or key signatures. There we go. So now I get something more like the real book look. And um, I'll narrow this measure also. Uh, it's a lot of fiddling, right, to try to uh, finagle this to try to get these widths to line up. And that's what it was in Finale also. Now, there used to be an option to try to force measures to the same width. It didn't work very well because you ended up with notes spilling outside the measure. Um, and so it ended up being removed. But there are ways of trying to make this happen other than fiddling them. So if you want to get line the bar lines to line up, you can do it by adjusting widths individually. I don't, again, I don't recommend that as a goal because it's actually counterproductive to reading. But having the measure, you know, trying to have measures not be too wide does help with uh, the, the spacing of the chords. But I'm going to, again, un undo my uh, stretch adjustments and show you a different way of maybe trying to con get these measures to be more consistent. I'm going to go to format, style, measure, and I'm going to set the minimum measure width to be as wide as I can while still fitting four measures on a line. And that's somewhere around, somewhere in the 20s is where it's going to, you'll see it couldn't fit the measure anymore. It's going to start shifting things around. Oh, right there. Notice at 23, I still have four measures there, but as soon as I went up to 24, hmm, oops, wrong way. As soon as I went up to 24, then uh, that measure got pushed to the next line. So I'm just gonna go with 20 because I'm stupid and like round numbers. Um, if I set 20 as my minimum measure width, you can see it's already given me more or less equal measures because that's about as wide as you can fit. 20 spaces is about as wide as you can fit four measures on a line. So by telling every measure to be that wide, it's still going to allow measures that need to be a little wider to be a little wider, but it's not going to make these empty measures as narrow. Um, so anyhow, that's something you can play with also. So I do see that there's stuff going on in the chat that I need to check up on. So I'm going to do that here. Um, uh, Good. I see something about the clefts and um, uh, I mean slurs. And uh, uh, so it looks like you've got a good answer there. So for oh, uh, for slurs between the. Um, uh, so, Dave, if, if you go back and watch uh, the video, uh, you know, later, you'll see I showed like four different ways of it. So it's definitely, uh, yeah, definitely uh, worth reviewing. Um, so yeah, so, um, if you want to have, mm, 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 and then in the left hand and you want a slur that comes from here down to here, I'm control clicking the two notes. So select one note, control click the next hit slur and you get a slur between them. If you want the dynamics to be different. Now, first of all, if, if, if you're just looking for a subtle playback effect, don't do that with dynamics. Just use the inspector to set the velocity. If you want the, the left hand a little quieter, select this, select the measure, then click the notes button in the inspector and scroll down to where you see the velocity and just turn down the velocity there. Set it to be negative 20. Negative 20, not meaning it's negative volume, but you know, uh, 20 less than, than the default. And now the left right hand will be louder. If though you really are trying to create a really specific effect where you really want to tell people, hey, I want you to do something other than just the normal thing that you would do. Like I really want the right hand pianissimo and the left hand fortissimo. Well, that's fine, you can do that. Add the dynamics. So right hand pianissimo, left hand fortissimo, and then in the inspector where it says dynamic range, change it from part to staff. And do it for both of them. There you go. So that's how you do that. Okay, so um, 
so anyhow, those were some of the things that that uh, that kind of came up over and over in doing these charts. Now, when I told it not to produce clefts, it unfortunately then therefore didn't give me a clef here. And you see how now this is ambiguous, right? You don't know what clef this uh, this system has because, well, gee, did the top staff disappear or did the bottom? So we definitely need there to be a clef there. So I'm going to have to manually add a clef to that measure. And of course, <laughs> the clef chain shows before the measure. So I can't even do it that way. I have to add it as a mid-measure clef change, which makes it small, which isn't really right. So unfortunately, this whole not showing clefs business is a little hard to fake in MuseScore. Maybe someone else could think of a cleverer way to do that, but I say don't do it. It's not standard. It was something that people just did to try to get their um, things uh their measures to line up a little better, but you don't need it. You don't need that. Now, maybe the key signatures take up a lot of space. And if your songs typically don't change key, if your songs change key, oh God, please don't make me remember, especially on a repeat or a DS, you know, don't make me remember which section's key I'm supposed to be honoring. If the song ever changes key, please always show me the key signature on every system. But maybe because key signatures are wide, you don't show that you don't show them to me all the time. But clefs aren't that wide. So I would much rather go back to the style dialog and just um, turn clefs back on. Because again, MuseScore can handle the evening out of things um, already. So uh, but you know, yeah, it did steal space from that measure, and you have to decide if that's how you want to do it or not. Um, so it's maybe a reason not to use that minimum uh, setting there, or to be less aggressive about it. Maybe, um, maybe just be say ten. I don't know. I'm just making this stuff up. I don't mess with this personally. So yeah, I don't even like that. I'd rather just I'd just rather leave it at the default. Because if I go back to the default of five, I think you'll see the measure widths look pretty good, right? They're they're pretty even. The cleft didn't stay, take that much space. And this system just doesn't look that bad, right? I mean, yeah, these measures are a little narrower, but it's just not bad. Um, to me, totally, totally, uh, you know, don't fight it. Just go with it. So um, uh, would I be interested in joining a Discord server? I'm already on several, but I don't necessarily have the time to just sit around and answer questions there. So I do go to the forums uh, a couple times a day and answer questions there. That's by far the best place, best place for support. Um, by far, I mean, like a thousand times better than anything else that's ever been invented because that's where all the other MuseScore experts are. That's where you can attach scores. If it turns out to be a bug, you're already logged in and can go to the issue tracker. So by all means, if users want to also use Discord servers, uh, they're welcome to, and we do have some within the development team. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I definitely always encourage people to use the forums. Um, but yeah, I, I am a member of a a few different Discord servers already. So, um, yeah, so this is exactly, the playback is exactly correct. I guarantee it. Uh, let me add some notes here. Oh, I know exactly what notes they are too, right? It's that boom, 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 mm -mm. Yeah, because it, it's exactly that. So let me enter that. Uh, and... And go down a staff. All right, this measure repeated four times. I'm going to select it, press R four times. That's what actually should get played. Ah, let me get rid of those chord symbols. Well, I'm going to get rid of their playback, right? Because I don't want it for this song. For a lot of songs, I actually like it. Like for Pinwheel, it's pretty cool. Check it out. I mean, it actually uh, it actually does something worthwhile, but for the 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 cast your fate to the wind here, it's not doing me favors at all. So I'm going to turn off the playback of the chord symbol on one of them, and then hit the set as style button. All right, now we're going to hear this. You can hear it plays back perfectly.
I guarantee you that was exactly perfect um, because MuseScore is not going to screw that up. Um, if I enter the rest of the song, uh, oops, wrong way. I'm just entering a little bit of this song, and then this one instead of this is this. Mm -mm 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 -mm. And then, all right, this is going to be perfect. Check it out. All right, I, I, it's going to bug me to not hear the uh, not hear the pickup. Right here we go. nailed it. So, um, yeah, the, these, <laughs> these techniques really do work. So, um, yeah, there's all sorts of decisions that came up in the course of doing these charts. And some of them, again, like things like not reproducing the clef, not reproducing the key signature, they did because that's what the original people did. The original people did it because that was the only way they knew how to just draw bar lines down a staff and get them to line up. But software can do this for us. We don't have to copy the mistakes or the decisions, the compromises made that were, you know, maybe helpful to non-expert engravers trying to do things by hand and making their bar lines line up. We don't have to make those same decisions today. So I definitely recommend you don't make those same decisions. So I would definitely recommend at least re reproducing the clefts, maybe the key signatures also, although that they do, they do take up more space. Um, but yeah, there were so many different decisions that came up in doing these charts, and I would discuss them with their uh, the chief editor, uh, a guy named Jeff Arnold, and uh, we would discuss you know what the rules were. He sent me at one point like a list of what some of their considerations were, and they were really interesting. Lots of lots of things that I hadn't thought about. I mean, stuff like splitting up the mid middle of the beat. I knew that, but the, oh, here's another one. Um, here, here's another one that's uh, interesting. Uh, this rhythm is pretty common in jazz. Um, eighth note and then eighth note tied to a dotted half note. In the real book, they don't use that notation for the rhythm. Instead, they notate it this way, which is quirky. I'm not going to claim this is standard because it's not, but check it out. This rhythm doesn't show you where beat three is. This version does show you, right? Beat three is right there. Um, so uh, this is no more complicated than this one. Their rule is if it's possible to show beat three without, like, so here you definitely need to show beat three because the, it's syncopated, the, the the way the eighth notes are there, this one needed to be shown. They, they, they absolutely needed that. In cases like this, they were like, well, you know what, if if you're going to need a tie anyhow, why not rearrange the notes in a way that allows you to see beat three? So this is not a common thing. It's not how most people would write this rhythm. This is the way most people would write the rhythm. This is the way the real book does it. And to me, it, it's it's not a bad idea. It, it's really not, especially if you think about putting chord symbols. Check this out. What if I had a C chord and then a G chord on beat three? First is a C chord and a G chord on beat three. Well, check it out. This G chord is floating in midair. Is that beat three, beat four, and a two? You don't know. Here, though, that G chord lines up really nicely with beat three. So in some senses, it is objectively better. It's it's not common, though, but it, it is one of the... Uh, one of the decisions that like I learned about from working on this project, and I don't remember if that was what the original real book did or something that uh, Hal Leonard uh, Jeff or Jeff Arnold personally imposed on it, but there, there were lots of decisions like this. So anyhow, I, I could go on forever talking about all these different things, but uh, the point is there's a lot of things that you can do in creating your lead sheets that will you know, really help 
people out. And you know, this idea that we want them to be one page where possible, two pages. Uh, like I don't think there's anything in the real book that goes beyond two pages. And so you get to decide how much to leave in, how much to how much to leave out. You know, do I want to show that uh, left hand part throughout the score? Well, no. Just showing it on the first staff is good enough. On the other hand, it was worth showing at all, right? Sometimes to save space, they might say, you know what? Yeah, there's a nice left hand figure, or a nice bass part, but we're going to let people figure it out by themselves. So sometimes that's the case. But for tunes like this one, where it's such a part of the piece, or all blues, where that boom, right, that little figure is such an important part of the piece, they couldn't very well leave that out. Um, so I say that, and then I'm wondering, or did they? No, they, I'm sure they didn't, right? Who would do that? Who would leave out the bass line to all blues? Ah. All blues. No, it's in there. Good. Um, so it's in there to show how it goes. And then they've even got the... Da, da, da. I don't think that was even in the original. The original was sparser. It didn't show as many intros. It didn't show as many interludes, special endings. The original Illegal Real Book mostly just stuck to the melody. Then there were the Chuck Share New Real Books that were really exacting about this, but it made almost all the charts go two pages. So they try to kind of struck a middle ground in the real book here, which I think was the right decision. Include intros when they seem really, really crucial to the piece. Same with endings. Include interludes where they're really crucial. Alternate chord changes for solos when it really seems crucial. Um, any of those things might make a chart go two pages. And here, just showing that bass line on the first line and showing that there was that intro felt really important. So yeah, th those are the kind of decisions you get to make in making a lead sheet. Or if it's a standard, like not written by a jazz composer, like this has one definitive recording. But if I'm looking at a song like, I don't know, I could write a book by Rogers and Hart, there's a million tunes, a million recordings of that. And yeah, there's a classic Miles recording that we could look to. Um, but there's a lot of other recordings that we might want to pay attention to to understand what key to put it in, what, you know, how to represent the chords and all. So there are a lot of just judgment calls to make that I really le learned how to do a good job of it working on this project. And um, yeah, it was a great experience. And a lot of the stuff, um, oh, I, I'm gonna show you one more thing. Uh, one thing that we were supposed to do is at the end of the uh, intro, put a double bar. Oh, at the end of each section, like here at the end of this section, there's a double bar. And then we want the double bar to appear at the start of the next section. MuseScore didn't used to allow that. If I put a double bar here, because that's not the norm. It, it's a real book-ism. But if I put a double bar here, no double bar appears there. But you can make one appear by selecting it and doing this. This was one of the many features we added to MuseScore specifically to support the kinds of things the real book does. So anyhow, uh, so anyhow, I hope you found uh, this interesting and useful. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I'm not a fan of not having the key signatures either. I'm music in B major that it takes up a lot of room, and if it's only a 32 bar tune, and uh, you know it's not going to change, uh, that's fine, uh, I guess. But uh, to 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 get rid of it, but I'd rather just keep them. So. Uh, Let's see. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure, what, Dave, what your last question is here. Um, uh, oh, by the way, oh, 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 here's a good question from Anne. Because uh, actually, yes, MuseScore can fix it. It absolutely can. If I had written, um, if I write this and then I select this measure and then I go to Tools, Regroup Rhythms, it will fix that for you. It doesn't do this automatically. Actually, when they first implemented it, they did make it do it automatically, but too many people complained. They said, no, 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 I want to be able to write what I want to write. And uh, so whatever, we allow you to write what you want to write, but we also give you the tool to fix it. So Dave, I'm not quite sure what you're asking about uh, in an alternative rhythm group. Yeah. So I guess it probably has to do with how this feature works and how it decides. This is all kind of built into the program. Yes, yeah, someday it would be really nice to make it uh, customizable somehow. And maybe that'll happen someday. So in any case, um, again, hope you've enjoyed the session. I'm going to... Uh, I think what I'll do is just sort of sign out and then just play out the music uh, rather than talk over it, because why not? So I hope everyone's had a, a, a good time here. And then uh, next week, we'll be back with more. 
Uh, just so you know, tomorrow music masterclass, same channel, same time on Thursdays. And I talk about making music as opposed to about creating charts and stuff. And so in honor, this is Jazz Appreciation Month, which is why I'm, I sort of did a whole thing focusing on some jazz stuff today. And I'm going to tomorrow also, but those of you who have been in the Music Masterclass know I've been talking about fugues also. I've got a jazz fugue. It's, it's a really cool piece that I wrote a few years ago, and I'm going to talk about that and whatever else and you know look at student pieces and whatever else. So definitely come join us for the Music Masterclass. We have a lot of fun there too. So uh, this uh, whole session brought to you by uh, the Mastery Music Score School, and I forgot to put that link in here. So please, if you've never been to my site, please, uh, masteringmusescore.com school.masterymusicscore.com. Please check it out and um, I'll pin it up to the top and um, uh, check out some of the resources I provide, the MuseScore course, the theory courses, etc. <sighs> All right, again, you've enjoyed this session. I'm talking over it anyhow. And um, again, uh, this is what we do every Wednesday. So come back for more. Go ahead and join. If you go to my site, make sure you sign up for my newsletter. It's uh, It used to just be sort of a sporadic mail. Now it's turning into an actual weekly newsletter. And uh, I've got more changes in store. Uh, so I will be really excited to tell you about them. Um, I'm always looking for ideas for topics to cover for these cafes. I, I don't mind recycling topics that I've talked about before because there's always new things to say and new people to check them out. But I love it if people have ideas that I haven't thought of before either. So that said, hope everyone has a great day, great week, and I'll catch you next time. <laughs>